come May, I learned something new that the church is involved in. It's called the Concert Series. And I've asked uh, Sherry Milson to give us a, a rundown of a Concert Series that begins. I'm going to stop right there and turn it over to you. This might crackle. I'm a little taller than Nonnie, so I just need to move this and it might crackle. Okay, last year, um, 2020 was a strange year, and there were many casualties, and one of the casualties was our concert series, which had to be cancelled, sadly. This year, we're having our concert series, pandemic permitting, um, and it's bigger and better than ever. Um, we have a great lineup, and in December, we, I'm so excited to tell you that we're opening with the one... The only Frank Sinatra. <laughs> okay, well, not the real Frank Sinatra, but you know, it's it's the second best as our pastor will vouch for, right? It's a friend of um, of of Ed. He has so many contacts that that prove to be so valuable to us, and this is one of them. Um, so on December fourth, we will we, we will kick open with uh, a Frank Sinatra tribute. In January, we have the Southwest Florida Big Band featuring our own Beth Mortland. Um, on February 12th, Erin Abu will have all the ladies swooning in the aisles, I tell you. Just look him up on um, Facebook or Google and you'll see what I mean. Um, and in March, we have the Four Flats featuring our own Bill Gorman, the, the barbershop quartet. You can help by attending these concerts, but also by helping to sponsor them. As you will know, those of you that have been to our concerts before, we don't charge an entry fee. We take up a love offering, um, but that doesn't cover the cost of, of uh, booking these concerts. So if you would like to just contribute a little bit or a lot to that, um, let Joanne in the office have your checks and just put on the bottom line concert series, and then we'll, we'll know. You can also help by uh, asking other people, like your hairdresser or your dentist or, uh, or whatever businesses you have contacts with, whether they would like to sponsor in a slightly bigger way, because we will advertise their businesses on the programs and the brochures that go out um, for a, a donation. Um, if they want to be a gold sponsor, that's $500 and up. If they want to be a silver sponsor, that's $250 and up. Um, but anything up to, you know, as little or as much, it all goes to help. Um, so I hope you will support us. I hope you'll uh, come, and I hope you'll really enjoy this year's concert series. It's great for bringing in our neighbors around as well as just us. So uh, tell people and come. Part of this passage, Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two to go to villages to teach and to heal. So a lot has happened from the time Jesus sent the disciples out. Their mission was very simple. Proclaim that all should repent and cured many who were sick. Today's story picks up with return of the apostles. And there was a, a lot of activity between the sending out and the coming back. Between that time, there was the death of John the Baptist. It's a dramatic story, a sad story. There was a, a birthday, a dancing daughter for King Herod, linked to the dancing, a promise by Herod to his daughter for anything she asked of him. She must have been a grand dancer. And this all ends with the death of John the Baptist. Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Apparently, Jesus had some Cracker Jack ushers from Laley counting the number of people who attended that day. You do know there's a difference between clergy counting and real counting, don't you? There is a difference. And after multiplying the loaves and fishes, Jesus walks on water before mooring the boat 
and meeting the sick. There's, there's so much activity taking place in Jesus' life. And before he gets neck deep in delivering hope, the story today opens with Jesus wanting his disciples to get some rest. They returned from their mission. Excitement filled their hearts. Enthusiasm drained their spirits. And Jesus wanted to listen and wanted them to rest. Jesus reinforces the concept of rest and Sabbath. And he tries to find a deserted place, a quiet place, to go with the disciples. Jesus had the right concept with deserted places. You know what the number one vacation spot is in the United States? It's not Naples, Florida. Sorry. It's the Grand Canyon. That's where people go. A desolate place. A quiet place. A big hole in the ground. That's the number one vacation spot in the United States. And so Jesus receives this oral report from the disciples. His focus is not on the quantity or quality of their work. He focuses on them to have rest. You know, we're so busy today, aren't we? Our lives are filled with such busyness. We've got to fill every... I'm that way. You know, that's why most of us move to Florida, to get away from the business of life, right? When I talk with the retired people, they say, I am busier than I've ever been in my entire life. People keep pinging you to volunteer for this and volunteer for that. You know, our lives were filled with careers that pushed the limits. This past week, I, I spoke with an old friend of mine, uh, Tim McKeithen. He was a retired two-star general from... Uh, his last assignment was in Hawaii, but I worked with him in Arlington, Virginia. And he is, he's a great guy. We'd do anything for him. And so I was planning to go to Guam to meet the chaplains there and speak at a prayer breakfast. And he said, hey, chaplain, you're going four days to Guam. I said, yes, sir. It takes No, that's too much time in Guam. I'm not going to spend the taxpayers' money that way. you got three days. Go to Guam and back in three days. I said, sir, it takes two days to get there. That's great. You go there, do your business, come back. That's what he said. Thank you, General McKeithen, for that. Busyness. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, great job, let's grab a bite to eat on Fifth Avenue and let's head to lunch, head to the beach. No, Jesus beckons the disciples to a deserted place, a quiet place. Today, people don't call favorite spots quiet places. They call them their happy places. Here are Jane's happy places. It's brownie the dog, and then Ocean City, New Jersey, where she spent her childhood every summer with her mom and dad. That's her happy place. There's a lot of activity in Mark chapter 6. Lots of comings and goings. They arrive at an expected place of rest only to be recognized. And that, you know, part of the discussion on last Monday was how do they recognize Jesus? There's no billboards out there. There's no iPhones or iMessengers sending pictures and stuff like that. There's this, maybe there's recognition of someone with authority and an ability to make a difference in people's lives. He's recognized. I don't know how, but he's recognized. And then once he's recognized, people bring him the sick, constantly bringing him the sick. There's no escape, no rest, no solitude, no break at all in his life. Several years ago, I was traveling from Miami to Washington, D.C. And there was a book that I had bought that just captured my imagination. I, I think it was a Dan Brown book that just, just sucked me in. And I was reading it like there was no tomorrow, you know, page after page after page. And sitting there at the gate, uh, a lost soul came up to me asking, is this the flight to D.C. at 2.40? Why, yes, I replied. And, I said, I'm just hanging here waiting for the plane to arrive, and I went back to my book. What are you reading? It's a Dan Brown book, I answered. I really like it. Long pause. Person sat down to me, next to me, less than three feet away. Then they asked, what do you do? I want to say I sell life insurance. <laughs> I got a great policy for you. 
or I sell used cars, but my honesty and integrity took over, and I said, well, I'm, I'm a Presbyterian minister, and I'm an army chaplain. I said, uh, what took you to Miami? My grandmother died. I closed the book, <laughs> put it down, and for the next 45 minutes, listened compassionately to a person's life who was torn up about someone who had died who meant a great deal to them. Opting for compassion, opting for giving time, opting for listening to a person to give them a place of quiet rest, a deserted place in an airport of all places, to talk about the challenges of their life is a Christian act of kindness. You do it for a stranger, you do it for friends, but you do it. You know, clergy aren't the only ones who experience that diversion in their lives or intrusion or chipping away of personal time. We all experience it. And, and what's our response? Nine times out of ten, our response is compassion. We are good people. We care about the human condition. Now, the word used by the gospel writers to describe compassion it's a word that's, that comes from the gut. The Greek word for compassion is splodnizomai. It comes from deep inside of you to say that word. It means to be moved to pity in one's inward parts. Compassion. There are moments that move us. You know, when the commercials seeking aid for abused animals comes on, I got to leave the room. I do. I see abused animals, it sickens me, it makes me angry. I hear about abused people, women and young girls being trafficked, angers me. In addition to triggering anger, it triggers compassion from the gut for people caught in modern day slavery. Plodnitzomai, from the gut, it moves our inner parts, compassion. What moves you to compassion? Text me your thoughts. 302-932-9861. I'll read them at the end of the sermon. Who else gives a cell number out during the sermon? The compassion of Jesus, it, it guides him to the crowds. And I thought about this the other day, you know, the word, it, it really is not part of the word, but it is compass is in the word compassion. It gives us direction on how to care for people. Jesus never gets to his happy place. He never arrives at a deserted place. The people find him. They follow him. They never stop pushing him because they want to be healed. And when you want someone you love to be healed, you will do anything to make sure that they are healed. The crowds push him. They crush him up against him. They reach to touch just a fringe of his garment. I've never been that desperate to be connected to a person. Have you? Yet the people who are so motivated to touch Jesus, it's like they're packed into Kemp Hall waiting for Helen to open the doors and let them into the sanctuary. I thought you'd like that. No, I guess not. People are hungry to meet Jesus. Back in 2011, Jane and I attended Ash Wednesday at a Catholic church located in Arlington, Virginia. From the outside, the place looked like a, a modern-day pizza hut. But the sanctuary was packed. The people in worship were just full of passion. Our time came to exit the pew and move forward for the imposition of ashes. And as we moved down the aisle together, there was an elderly person who possessed a very strong inclination and desire to see the priest before we did. The person actually cut in line 
to get the ashes. I looked at Jane and I said, these must be really good ashes. The same happened for communion. The person raced ahead and butted in line to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I, I don't know why the person did that, but we meet a compassion to Jesus. Sometimes the symbols in our life are so alluring, they are so attractive that it just draws us to them, whether it be communion or ashes or that touch, that compassion that we so desperately need in our lives for someone to listen to us when our lives are just falling apart. Jesus teaches when he is weary. He touches and heals when he wants to be alone. He feeds 5,000 when he himself is hungry. His compassion guides him to people. The compassion does not withdraw him from folks. It guides him to people who are like sheep without a shepherd. You know, most of the crowds do not fit our congregation of the 21st century. Our congregations are not the desperate crowds of Mark 6. No one's rushing ahead to get to see the preacher on Sunday morning. No one's lining up outside the church on Saturday night so they get a seat on Sunday morning. It's not like a rock concert where people line up. It's not like you're buying an iPhone, what, 36, whatever the new one is coming out. Our congregational crowds, well, they're pretty predictable. But the crowds in Mark, man, they're desperate. The feed of the 5,000 may not completely refer to feeding people. Maybe, let me throw this at you, maybe the feeding of the 5,000 is connected to the spiritual feeding of the crowds where they hope to find wholeness with Jesus. Mark describes the situation. For many were coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat, and they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. No leisure even to eat. I had a theology professor in seminary who said, we need to have a theology about eating. We've just made it this ancillary part of life. We go through McDonald's or Burger King. We get our burger. We go. We're eating it going down the road with the ketchup dripping on our pants and the napkins on the side car and the, all that stuff. We, the sense of a sacred meal, knowing that we ourselves did not prepare that meal but was given by the grace of God, God's self, is something to be thankful for. Because when we break bread with other people, it is a sacred moment of fellowship. And we have diminished that to just a quick, happy meal and not a holy meal. The phrase, no leisure even to eat, seems to apply more to corporate America than it does to first century Galilee. Mark implies that the needs of the people were completely overwhelming. The need for humanity just pressed upon them with such immediacy that Jesus and the disciples, they just couldn't get away from the crowds. Getting away. There are times you just have to escape. Replace the spirit, the mind, and the heart. You just have to let the phone ring. Not answer all the emails. And take care of yourself so you can take care of other people so you have the the water in your spiritual well to be compassionate. And yet the roadblocks, man, there's so many of them. There's a guilt of not doing anything. I come from a culture that underscored idle hands of the devil's or the devil's workshop. And that's that's biblical. Proverbs, Proverbs 16. That's what I grew up with. Do not let a moment go by where you can't do anything productive. Keep busy. Isn't that the phrase we were born with? It's like the old joke where the custodian was cleaning the sanctuary on a Sunday morning. Looking from the back, he, he saw a figure that it, the person looked familiar to, to him, but he wasn't quite sure. He went down halfway the aisle, and oh my God, it was Jesus himself in the back of the sanctuary. He took another look and said, i got to tell the pastor this. Custodian runs to the pastor's office, goes to her office, and says, you won't believe this, but Jesus is in the back of our sanctuary. The pastor said, have you been, you know, 
hitting the bottle again or, or what's going on here? No, no, come, come with me. So they go out there. They go, they walk in the door through Camp Paul. They look in the sanctuary and it's Jesus in the back of the sanctuary. The custodian says to the pastor, what should we do? I, I don't know, but just look busy. Just look busy with Jesus here. Looking busy. Ministry is more than just about looking busy. Busyness is the worst of wasting our time, doing things for just the sake of doing them. That's one of my pet peeves in meetings, whether it be the military or the church, meetings that go nowhere. We tend to overanalyze, stay busy, do things. I'm not sure all those things we do advance the kingdom of God. I'm not sure all those things we do expresses the compassion of Christ. Our busyness helps us aim aimlessly. On the other hand, the compassion of Jesus gives us direction, compassion for the elderly, compassion for those who mourn, compassion for the lonely, compassion for people who are like sheep without a shepherd. The folks of Mark were so desperate for wholeness and healing. Let me just touch the fringe of your cloak. They wanted to be made whole. Lately, Presbyterian church is like an extension of Jesus' cloak. People seek to touch something or someone that assures them of care. Touch is so important in life. The touch of the hand. The touch of the fringe of Jesus' garment. The holding of hands. The, the presence of someone who is just who just cares and is full of compassion. Compassion guided Jesus' ministry. Compassion guided the disciples. Compassion guides us. Compassion prevents us from aiming aimlessly in life. Let me just talk about a couple. What, what moves you to compassion? A lonely person. Someone's personal loss. I feel compassion when I see people who are not being treated nicely or bullied. It brings something out of us, that splagmitsomai, that from the inside of us, that causes us to be compassionate. Let's pray. Holy God, send some companions who can look in a pained face and not turn away, who can look at bruises and scars and not pull back, who can hear anger and rage and not run away. Who can touch a fragile body with tenderness and not pity. Who can stay through the dark nights and shadowed days. Holy God, touch us and use us to be the neighbor, the friend to those in need with compassion. Amen.